It's 4 p.m. on Wednesday, December 17th here in Korea, live from Seoul. I'm Nae Hyun Gyeong. We start with North Korea. Since midnight, Pyongyang has been airing special programs commemorating late leader Kim Jong il, as today marks the third anniversary of his death. Now, he died of a heart attack in 2011. Citizens have reportedly been lining up to pay their respects in Pyongyang, where a series of highly publicized events praising the late Kim's achievements during his rule were held. The regime reportedly opened a grand ceremony just a short while ago to commemorate him, where current leader Kim Jong-un is expected to be in attendance. Considering that this year ends the official three-year mourning period for the late leader, experts also say Pyongyang will use this time to publicize Kim Jong-un's full grip on power. Now, back in 2011, right after Kim Jong Il's death, there were doubts about whether Kim Jong Un will be able to fill his father's boots. Many experts now say he has successfully cemented his own inner circle of aides and officials whom he can trust. Hwang Sung Hee tells us more. He's bold and charismatic with the military, warm and friendly with children, and not afraid to reveal his weaknesses. At the same time, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un rules with an iron fist. Three years into power, the young Kim is believed to be in the final stages of forming his own power base, ruthlessly removing anyone perceived to be disloyal. The 31-year-old launched a reign of terror last year when he executed his uncle Chang sung tae Since then, Chang's wife Kim Kyung-hee has vanished from the public eye, apparently replaced by Kim's younger sister Yeo Jung, who has been given a vice ministerial position in the party. And Kim Jong-un makes sure that no one gains too much power. Choi Ryong-hae, who is generally regarded as the second most powerful figure within the regime, has frequently moved up and down the power ladder. So he's been using his powers of appointment, dismissal, promotion, and putting people into uh, place, into offices. And in exchange, they provide um, uh, political uh, loyalty. While Kim Jong-il bestowed immense power to the military during a famine in the 1990s, the young Kim has shifted command back to the party. During the Kim Jong-un era, operations within the party have been normalized. The military has been placed under the party, no longer a special class, enjoying special favors. Going forward, Kim Jong-un is expected to step out of his father's shadows and rule North Korea his way. Kim Jong-un's style politics, economy, social culture, diplomacy and defense. It's highly likely that Kim Jong-un introduces policies led by him that bear his own colors. This while bearing a striking resemblance to his grandfather and North Korean founder Kim Il-sung, which experts say is part of attempts to justify the third-generation power succession. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Well, the movie The Interview, which revolves around a plot to assassinate Kim Jong-un, will be released on Christmas Day as originally scheduled in the U.S., but the hackers that launched a massive cyber attack on its production company Sony Pictures last month are now making serious threats mentioning the 9-11 attacks. For more on this story, here's Song ji -san. Remember the 11th of September 2001. That's the warning from hackers who want to stop the Sony Pictures movie, the interview, from being released in U.S. theaters. The comet is set to hit screens around the country on Christmas Day. In a message posted Tuesday, the group, which calls itself Guardians of Peace, threatened the movie maker saying, quote, We will clearly show it to you at the very time and places the interview be shown, including the premiere, how bitter fate those who seek fun and terror should be doomed to. Fingers are expected to be pointed at Pyongyang for this latest threat. There have been unfounded rumors North Korea was behind last month's cyber attack on Sony Pictures because of the nature of the movie's plot. The movie stars Seth Rogen and James Franco as celebrity journalists who score an interview with Kim Jong-un, only to have the CIA order them to use the opportunity to pull off an assassination. 
The two actors have canceled media appearances following the threat, with the hacker threatening to attack the premieres after this Thursday in New York. U.S. government officials have been quoted as saying that they are aware of the message, but they're downplaying the warning, saying it's highly unlikely the hackers would try and make good on their threat. Song Ji Sun, Arirang News. The former vice president of Korean Air is being questioned by prosecutors this afternoon. She didn't say much before she stepped into the building. All eyes are now on whether an arrest warrant will be issued for Cho Yeon-ha and what kind of charges she will face. Kim In-ji has the story. The probe into the nutrage controversy continues. Cho Hyun-ha, the former vice president of Korean Air, appeared before prosecutors in Seoul on Wednesday afternoon. She walked through the media waiting outside with her head down and she said she was sorry but didn't respond to any questions. Attention is being drawn to whether an arrest warrant will be issued for Jo, who made a soul-bound Korean Air flight turn back to the gate to deboard the head of cabin crew, all because she was upset that her nuts were not served according to the manual for first-class passengers. Prosecutors will look into whether Jo's actions broke aviation laws. Joe has admitted to telling the head of cabin crew to deboard, but says she never ordered the plane to turn around. Joe will also be questioned on whether she engaged in evidence tampering. Crew members and a passenger who witnessed the incident say Korean Air officials had pressured them to give false testimonies. Prosecutors are also looking into whether abusive language and violence was used. Joe denies allegations of any type of physical abuse. On Tuesday, Korea's transportation ministry filed a complaint with the prosecution against the former executive. Korean Air could be hit with a fine of up to 1.3 million U.S. dollars or even a three-week-long suspension of operations between New York and Seoul. Kim min Arirang News. Russia is facing a full-blown recession with a combination of falling oil prices, Western sanctions and the crumbling currency. The central bank's decision to hike its key interest rate by more than 5 percentage points this week was apparently not enough to stop the crisis. Ji myung -gil has more. The consensus among economists is that Russia's economy is spiraling into darkness, being dragged down by the weight of the crumbling ruble. The central bank's move this week to raise its key interest rate by 6.5 percentage points is just one of many warning signs. Without any doubt, the situation is very difficult and it needs absolute coordination in action from the government and the central bank. Coordinated action we are ready for. But despite the central bank's action, the ruble dropped more than 11 percent against the U.S. dollar on Tuesday, the steepest fall since the Russian financial crisis of 1998. All we talk about is the ruble rate stabilization. We think that the exchange rate now does not correspond with fundamental macroeconomics circumstances. And it's visible even through how it's being detached from the dynamics and the conjuncture of the oil prices. Oil prices have dipped below $60 a barrel, which is exerting pressure on the Russian economy. Should that trend continue into next year, the Russian economy is forecast to shrink up to 4.7 percent. Net capital flow could reach as high as $134 billion this year, more than double the total from last year. Worsening matters, the U.S. is planning further sanctions on Russia for its involvement in Ukraine. Kim Young Adirang News. Well, reflecting the plunging global oil prices, Korea's producer prices slipped again for the fourth straight month in November. The Bank of Korea says the producer price index, which is an indicator of future consumer inflation, 
dropped nearly 1% in November from a year earlier. That's the lowest level since uh, December 2010. With oil prices plunging by more than 15 percent this month, the price of coal and petroleum products also went down, falling nearly 20 percent compared to last year. The prices of agricultural goods jumped more than 2 percent in the same period. Now, two-way trade between Korea and Vietnam is on course to smash on an all-time yearly high in terms of volume this year. This forecast is expected to rise even further as the Korea-Vietnam free trade deal concluded a matter of weeks ago is set to come into effect in the months to come. Kim ji reports. Korea and Vietnam are hitting it off on the trade front. Trade volume between the two countries is forecast to soar past 30 billion U.S. dollars for the first time this year. The accumulated volume between the two already recorded $25 billion during the January to October period, 40 times more than what was recorded when they first opened trade ties some 40 years ago. And it seems the volume is expected to shoot up even further as a bilateral free trade agreement was concluded earlier this month. With the FTA deal, Korean exports to Vietnam are expected to increase by up to 28 percent, while Vietnamese exports to Korea are projected to increase by 20 percent. In turn, it's expected to boost Korea's GDP by up to 0.7 percent and increase Vietnam's by more than 3 percent. Vietnam is currently Korea's eighth largest trading partner, while Korea is Vietnam's sixth largest. Korea's exports to Vietnam are mainly in the form of intermediate goods such as steel, petrochemical products and electronic components. A large portion of their imports of Korean goods are made by some 3,000 Korean companies currently located in Vietnam. For example, Korean exports of telecommunications parts rose sharply by 24 percent this year from the previous year following a $5 billion investment by Korea Samsung Electronics after it built a plant in the Southeast Asian nation. Korea imports textiles and agriculture and fisheries products from Vietnam and is expected to open up its market for nearly 500 additional Vietnamese products. Kim Jung, Arirang News. The number of patent requests worldwide shot up last year. A study by the World Intellectual Property Organization shows requests were up 9 percent across the globe compared to a year earlier. China had the lion's share at 32 percent of the global total, followed by the U.S. and Japan. Korea came in fourth on the list at 8 percent. Now, patent filings are generally considered a yardstick for measuring the strength of innovation and competitiveness of a country. Globally, over 2.5 million patent applications were filed last year. Korea has secured a second deal to export homegrown K9 self-propelled howitzers. Under the agreement, Samsung Tequin will sell 120 of the howitzers to Poland for $320 million. A first batch of two dozen will be exported by 2017. The rest will go through a technical transfer and be manufactured in Poland. Back in 2001, Samsung Techwin signed a deal with Turkey to export more than 300 units of the K9 howitzers. Bringing you the fresh updates from stories breaking in Korea and abroad. We give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Join Na Hyung Gang live from Seoul every weekday only on Arirang. Pakistan is reeling from a heinous attack on a school that has left at least 145 people dead, most of them young kids. The Taliban has claimed responsibility and the Pakistani government has vowed retribution. Khan Kim reports. What began as regular school day for students in the city of Peshawar ended in tragedy. Seven gunmen intent on killing cut through the wire fence of a military-run school and started in the auditorium where an event was being held and opened fire. The assailants then went door to door shooting students and teachers in their classrooms. At the end of their eight hour assault, at least 145 people, mostly students, were dead. The siege ended in a shootout with the Pakistani military killing all seven attackers. 
The Taliban quickly claimed responsibility, saying it was revenge for a Pakistani military offensive that has been targeting the Taliban's base of power since June. Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif said his government would not back down. Our prayers go to the families whose children were killed in this tragedy. I think this war and struggle will continue until the terrorism is completely rooted out of this country. World leaders were quick to condemn the violence. No cause can justify such a brutality. No grievance can excuse such a horror. It is an act of horror and rank cowardice to attack defenseless children while they learn. U.S. President Barack Obama said that terrorists had once again showed their depravity. Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India, Pakistan's longtime rival, said the school attack was a crime against humanity and called for vigilant action. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Meanwhile, in Australia, thousands of people have come out to pay tribute to the two hostages who never made it out alive of the 16-hour siege that rocked the nation this week. At a, mem at a memorial service, Archbishop Anthony Fisher said 34-year-old cafe manager Tori Johnson tried to wrestle the gun out of the hostage taker's hands, triggering the police raid. And 38-year-old lawyer and mother of three, Katrina Dawson, was shielding a pregnant friend from gunshots. Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott acknowledged that a new a tough national security law, which was passed in October, had failed to prevent the hostage crisis. He promised a transparent investigation on why the Iranian with a long criminal history was not put on any terror watch list. Former Florida, uh, Fl Florida rather, Governor Jeb Bush has given his biggest indication yet that he will make a run in America's next presidential elections slated for 2016. On his Twitter and Facebook pages, he said he reached the decision to actively explore the possibility after consulting with his family over the Thanksgiving holiday. The 61-year-old said he plans to establish a political action committee by January to gather ideas that will expand prosperity for all Americans. Jeb Bush is the brother and son of two former U.S. presidents, uh, George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush, respectively. Now, a team of uh, local scientists have merged science and art to identify and analyze different painting techniques from historical time periods spanning 800 years. Connie Lee shows us what a masterpiece would have looked like if it was drawn in a different period. Take a look. It's one of the most famous masterpieces in art history, Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. But what if da Vinci was actually born after the Renaissance period? How then would Mona Lisa have looked? Well, now with the help of science, we have an idea. The iconic painting, if created in the Rococo or late Baroque period of the 18th century, would have been brighter, used more delicate colors with rougher brushstrokes. So how was this conclusion made? Using digital analysis of nearly 9,000 Western paintings spanning over 800 years, local scientists have been able to identify different colors and techniques used in different time periods from the 11th century to the mid-19th century. Professor Chung ha Wung and his colleagues from Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology analyzed the big data not only to bridge art and science, but also for practical use. With the collection of all this data, it can help differentiate real works of art from the forged ones and also help restore masterpieces to be more like the original. The study, printed in the scientific journal Nature, shows that paintings have evolved to become more colorful and complex in terms of contrast and brightness since the medieval period, where after oil paints were first introduced. Connie Lee, Arirang News. A heartwarming documentary about the life of a couple that has been together for three quarters of a century has become an unexpected hit here in the nation. And it's not just the elderly who are going to the cinemas. Our Konzua reports. <laughs> Bernardo. 
더 나았죠? 그럼 남편 당선이 양주가 그래. 아이고, 그냥 더 낫네. 하루죠. 인물이 아주 한 하우야. Not many words were needed for this documentary to warm the hearts of more than one million moviegoers in Korea. My Love, Don't Cross That River tells the true 76-year love story of an elderly couple. 89-year-old Kan ge yeol and 98-year-old Jo byung man have been together since 1938. Director Jin mo Young decided to zoom in on the couple's simple life in a mountainous village in Gangwon-do province after watching an earlier TV documentary about them called Grey-Haired Lovers. The film was released in 186 theaters late last month, but due to its popularity, it's now being shown on more than 800. Last weekend, the documentary beat out Hollywood blockbuster Interstellar. What's interesting is that the number of young people checking out the film is higher than expected. More than half of the viewers have been in their 20s. I felt a lot while watching The Grandmother. I learned what real love is about. I really enjoyed it. I want everyone to watch it. The movie has brought tears to viewers and film critics alike, who say the lifelong love story shows that real love does not wither with age. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And some more cultural news. A couple of long-anticipated Broadway musicals have landed in Seoul. It's the first time both musicals are being staged in a language other than English. Im Yuni gives us a sneak peek. Charlie Price needs to find a way to save his family business in shoemaking. Then he meets entertainer Lola, who opens his eyes to a whole new world, giving him just what he may need to save the company. Tony Award-winning Broadway musical Kinky Boots has set foot in town for its first ever international staging. The long-awaited musical boasts a creative team of award-winning artists, and the Korean adaptation retains all the glitz and glamour that originally captivated audiences. You have to always have a way for people you meet to understand you, and in the process, you find your own confidence. You can even think of it as your job, always keeping it in mind. But that's not the only hit musical riding into town. Once has finally opened its curtains in Seoul. With eight Tony Awards under its belt, it's a love story of a couple of musicians who communicate through their music. Also the first non-English adaptation of the musical, the Korean version has the help of the original production team. Because there was no conductor, we had to figure out a lot by ourselves. That was difficult, but we also had to sing, play instruments and act, plus switch scenes on our own, which wasn't easy. This cast serves as both the actors and the orchestra, bringing a lively vibrance to the stage, warming up these cold winter nights. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Today is the coldest day of the season. I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. The skies over Seoul are mostly clear. However, a high wind alert have been issued all across the country, which is dropping down the sensory temperatures to as low as minus 15 degrees. And looking at the entire peninsula, the cold wave continues and most of our highs are expected to remain in the negatives, especially in the upper regions where lows will drop to low as minus 10, while southern regions will linger around 0 degrees. Now besides this cold, some regions can also expect snow today. Most of these regions will see between 1 to 5 centimeters, while there is heavy snowfall alert over in effect for Toledo provinces. Now to our readings for today. So it is around minus 5 this afternoon and the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan is a bit warmer at minus 1 and 1 degrees. And to other regions, Jeju Island peaks to 4 while Tokyo is at minus 4 while Mount Kino drops down to negative 14. Well that's all for now. I'm Sean Park and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world.
That's all we have for you now. Thanks for watching our next newscast coming up at 6 p.m. Korea time.